Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Insha'Allah, we'll start at 8 with Ibnillah. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jal and thanking Him and saying salah and salam upon His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asking Him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for support and assistance and protection and guidance so that we say the best and we hear the best and we implement the best and we adorn ourselves with the best of character, the character that we find in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and that is the purpose of this whole thing is to understand the adab, the etiquette, how Allah wants us to behave and then try to implement as much of it as possible, insha'Allah. A reminder in case I forget, insha'Allah, uh, if you are in Toronto, uh, in Canada in general, right, we're going to be uh, moving our uh, clock back one hour. So uh, for that, if you're here, insha'Allah, Next week, we're going to move our time, our, our lecture from uh, 8 to 7, Toronto time. If you're in Malaysia, it's not going to affect you. If you're in Malaysia, you're still going to be 8. Our 7 will still be your 8. But if you are here, inshallah, or anywhere else, try to adjust. And remember, inshallah, that next week, we're not going to be meeting at 8 o'clock Toronto time, but 7 o'clock Toronto time. So we're going to move it one hour back. So, almost half hour after Isha, right? Because now we're meeting half after uh, half hour after Isha. Uh, next week, inshallah, half hour after Isha. Maybe that will help you remember. But again, if you're in Malaysia, inshallah, that's not going to affect you. So we want to do, inshallah, today get into, at least begin with, um, manners related to uh, how we dress. But before we do that, we have to finish a part about eating and drinking. So etiquettes of eating and drinking, finish that part first, conclude it, and then inshallah, we'll go into uh, etiquettes related to attire and what you wear and what you do not wear. So let's get into finish inshallah, conclude that part about food and drinks. The author says, and it's recommended to clean between your teeth after eating. Okay? And he says, and avoid what Allah prohibited, you will be guided. So in that verse of poetry, and what we're reading when I say the author said, this is, all, this is part of his poem. So in this verse of poetry, he says it's recommended to clean between your teeth. Now, there is no specific evidence to say that it is recommended where the Prophet ﷺ say, clean between your teeth. So that part is not there. But we can say that in general, it is recommended. Why is in general it would be recommended? Because, because it's hygienic. Uh, it cleans your teeth and protects them. Protects you from bad breath. All of that is recommended. So because this helps it, that would be recommended as well. Right? So cleaning between your teeth, meaning flossing, would be something that is recommended because of the benefits that it brings. Even though there is no specific hadith about it to say, if you do this, then you'll get that, or the Prophet used to do this, or he commanded it. But in general, the Sharia testifies to that if it's beneficial and it protects from harm, then it will be something that is recommended. So what the author is saying, rahimahullah, is true. So if you floss and you're doing it right, especially with a proper intention, that in itself will be ibadah. If you're flossing out of it with a good intention, inshallah. And we can, you know, attach to it siwak or cleaning your teeth in general. 
So the Prophet ﷺ recommended siwat before every salah. Okay, or if not siwat, let's suppose that you don't have a siwat, what do you do? You basically just clean your teeth. Whether you brush your teeth, for instance, or you just basically make sure that uh, your teeth, your mouth is clean before you go into salah. Uh, you rinse your mouth, you brush your teeth, whatever it is. But when he said وسلم, that siwak is recommended, he also can take from that that cleaning your teeth and cleaning your mouth is in general recommended. So flossing would become also recommended. Right? Okay. Then he goes, he says, and it is recommended to wash your hands before and after you eat. And it is disliked to wash hands with edible food without exception. So two parts here. The second part is says, don't clean your hands with food. We'll explain, you know, what that means. Because it's wasteful. Don't clean your hands with food. But washing your hands before and after, he says it is recommended. Now again, just like in the previous one, there is no specific hadith that says, wash your hands before you eat, wash your hands after you eat. There's no specific thing. Yes, we have some evidence from the Prophet ﷺ that he washed his hands. Okay? But it does not mean that there is a specific hadith that commands it. But what we can take, maybe inshallah, to support that washing your hands is a good habit, is a good habit, and it also could be recommended, is what? That if there is a hadith that where he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man bata wa fi yadayhi ghamar, you know, if one sleeps and there is fat on his hand, meaning you eat and you don't wash your hands and you you're left with fat on your hand, he said, if somebody does that, فَأَصَابَهُ شَيْءٍ Something happens to him, فَلَا يُلُمَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ Let him not blame but himself. So let's say if you go to bed and you did not wash your hands and there is, you left some fat or traces of food on it and something bad happens. Now what is this bad thing that happens? He doesn't tell us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but maybe in an area where you have animals, an animal could be attracted to you while you're asleep, okay? An animal could be attracted to you while you're asleep. Let me see, suddenly that my connection is, okay. Okay, inshallah, maybe we'll reconnect. Khair, inshallah, I think it's reconnecting. Okay, khair, inshallah. Um, so, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if, you, yeah, if you're in an area where it is, um, they're wild animals, let's say, or they're animals in general, or SubhanAllah, we don't understand the harm. We don't understand really what the harm is. So if that's the case, if that's the case, he says, you're going to be harming yourself if you don't wash your hands. So that tells us that it is recommended that you wash your hands. Especially if there's a trace of food on them because you don't know what kind of thing they'll be attracting. So we can agree with the author and say, yes, it is recommended that you wash your hands. Right? It is recommended that you wash your hands before you eat and definitely after you eat. Okay? So in general, we can say that it is also recommended. Now, is it necessary for you to make wudu? Okay? Is it necessary for you to make wudu? Before you eat? Oh, okay, subhanAllah, okay. That's what I thought. The connection is uh, getting in and out. Khair, uh, inshallah. Um, not much I can do about it. Khair, uh, inshallah. Okay, I hope it's more stable now. Um, so let me, inshallah, let me let me summarize. So let me what what I can do, inshallah, is try to summarize what I've said so far. Um, so what I've said so far, in case you've missed anything, inshallah. So we said that it is recommended to clean between your teeth, and we say that why is this recommended? There is no specific hadith that says that you should clean between your teeth, but we said that in general. The Sharia would attest to it. The Sharia, they would attest to it because you'd be protecting your mouth 
protecting your teeth, uh, saving yourself from bad breath, saving yourself from disease. So flossing, we can say it's recommended because the Sharia ah would push towards what protects you and against what harms you. So that's true. So we can say that is the case. And we also talked about siwak. Siwak would also support the fact that we should clean our teeth repeatedly, continuously making sure that they are clean, especially after you eat, especially when you want to go and pray. So siwak is recommended at each salah, at each salah's time. So that's recommended, okay? So that's the summary of that first verse. The second verse, right, we said that it's recommended to wash your hands uh, before and after you eat. You say, what could maybe testify to that is that there is a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu that says that man bata wa fi ghamar, the one who sleeps and there is fat left on his hand, meaning from, from after eating, there's fat on his hand and he did not wash it. فَأَصَابَهُ شيء, Something happens to him, let him not blame but himself. Why not blame but himself? Because he didn't follow the advice of the Prophet ﷺ and did not wash his hands. So that's an important thing to remember. That is, what type of harm we're talking about, we don't know what type of harm it is. Is it animals? Possible. Is it something else? He did not elaborate. So it's generally, inshallah, recommended that if you eat something, especially something that is fatty, you clean your hand and you rinse your mouth before you go to bed. Okay? Okay. So the part here, the question that I've asked, that is it recommended for you to have wudu before you eat? We say, no, it's not. Wudu is for salah. So the Prophet Wasallam once, right, uh, he went and relieved himself, washed his hands, and came back to eat, or came to eat. The Sahabi asked him, O Prophet of Allah, you did not make wudu. So he said, am I going to pray? Like, am I going to pray so that I would make wudu? He's sitting to eat. So you say it's not recommended that when you want to eat, that you should make wudu. Okay, wudu is for salah, for reading the Quran. If you want to simply just be in a state of wudu, you can, but we can't say that wudu is recommended for eating. Okay. So, and there is also a remark um, uh, or a, uh, an additional you know, benefit here, inshallah, that in some cultures, uh, you would be, uh, after you eat, somebody would come and they would wash your hands, right, or your finger, tips of your finger, in your plate. You see, that's allowed as well. As long as the culture permits it, that is allowed also, inshallah. So there's nothing wrong with that. If the culture does not permit it, and people are simply used to go and wash their hands somewhere else, you know, then that's what they will do, inshallah. Now, the second part is important. He says, using edible food to clean your hand. Or... Uh, drinkable liquids, meaning that you should wash your hands using what? Water. Now what happens, you know, if you want to wash your hands using milk? We say, well, no, that's wasteful. Why would you do that? Or you want to clean your hands, as the example brought in the uh, explanation, with salt. You just wash your hands with salt. And water is available. You say, why would you do that? So there is something edible or drinkable other than water Okay, they say you don't use it to cleanse your body with it because it is wasteful. The exception being why, if you need that thing, if there is a specific reason why you would need that thing, then that's different. But if there is no need, you wouldn't waste food by using it to cleanse your body or to cleanse your hands. Okay, inshallah. So it's frozen still? Khair, inshallah. Um, okay. So I don't know if, uh, so I don't know if there is still uh, trouble with the f YouTube. Mm. Honestly, I don't know what to do with it. I think it's, I think we're okay on Facebook, right? And Instagram, I think we're okay. Uh, but we're having issues on um, YouTube. Hmm. 
it does tell me that I am connected, inshallah, but um, okay. Okay, so IG also we're having so we're having trouble with all of them. So the connection is slow today. Khair inshallah. Um try to do our best inshallah. Um let me see if I can somehow disconnect here or no. Let me see. So let me see if IG uh, behaves better. Um, and we'll just hope that YouTube is is okay, inshallah. We will try. Khair, <clears throat> inshallah. And if it's like, if it's absolutely not working at all, inshallah, I mean, there's, we can just... Um, Summarize this lecture or repeat it inshallah if you simply cannot access it or we don't have a good recording inshallah We can just repeat it inshallah um, Okay Okay, so if there is as, as we said if there's um, edible food something to eat and something to drink Then yes, we're not gonna use our hands to wash it alhamdulillah So I hear that IG is better. So we're using Wi-Fi now. I'm just using uh, data so I think it's better. Khair, inshallah. Um, let me see. Where am I at? Okay. Khair, inshallah. Let's, let's continue. Khair, inshallah. Um, he moves on, inshallah, to say, uh, eat fine foods or the opposite, meaning eat good food or humble food. Eat good food or humble food, he says. Good food or the opposite. And wear what is available as long as it is halal and do not restrict yourself. Proceed to end. Okay, inshallah. So, eat fine foods or the opposite and wear what is available as long as it is halal and do not restrict yourself. What does he mean by that? Which is really a good advice. He says, if what is available to you is fine food, good food, he says, eat that. Or what is available is humble food. Simple food. He says, eat that. And wear what is available to you. Right? Meaning, don't pick a specific path in life and say, I'll only wear the worst of clothes. Or I'll only wear the best of, clo best of clothes. Only this or only that. Or you say, I'll only eat the best of food. Or I'll only eat the worst of food. So don't restrict yourself to this or to that, okay? Take what is available as long as it is halal and do not restrict yourself. Why is he saying this? Because this was the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu Now the Prophet avoided luxury, luxury like over the top, avoided luxury. But if he found good food that was available, meat, honey, Sweets, he would eat it. If it's not available, he would simply eat dates and drink water, and that was it. If there is uh, a good garment, okay, a suit available for him to wear, uh, to go out for Jum'ah ah or to meet the delegates, he would wear it, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If not, he'll wear whatever is available. Whatever is available, as humble as it may be, he would wear it. So he wouldn't seek a specific path where he would say only this garment, only this clothing, only this color, only this food and nothing else. And that's what he means here, rahimahullah. So saying to yourself, for instance, I'll never eat meat, I'll never eat sweets, I'll never eat something that is um, fine. He says, that is not sunnah, this is bid'ah. Now, excessive luxury, that's something else. Excessive luxury, that is something else. But forbidding what Allah has allowed is not sunnah. It was not the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu as it was not the action of the Sahaba, right? So he says, be easy going and eat and wear whatever is available. Virtue is not in a particular garment and not another, or a particular food and not another, 
all of it as long as it is halal. You can eat from this and you can eat from that. What you avoid, as we will see inshallah later on, is excessive luxury, but not good food if whatever good food is available. And you want to give your body what it needs and your soul what it needs. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu right, when there was meat, he didn't say, I'm not going to eat meat because taqwa is in not eating meat. And he is the best person who had practiced taqwa. The best person who had practiced zuhd. And yet, he liked sweets and he ate them when they were available. He ate chicken and he did not deprive himself and say, I will not eat it because it is halal. But when it's not available, he would not rush after it. He would not demand it, but it will go with whatever Allah has given and provided for him. If what he had provided is a good food that had, a good food that had come his way, he'll eat it. If it is not, then he will not eat it. He will enjoy Allah's ni'mah and give the self what it needs. Example, for instance, he wouldn't pray the whole night, but will pray and sleep. He didn't say, I will never get married, but he got married. He never said, I will not have children, but he had children. So all of that shows you the balance of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that is the balance that we should follow. Okay. So um, as the scholars have said, you know, you can deprive your soul sometimes, your nafs sometimes, your body sometimes, to discipline it. You can do that, but you cannot do that all the time because then your nafs will turn against you. You will weaken your body, you will weaken your soul, and they will turn against you because you have burdened them with deprivation. Someone who says, for instance, I'll never wear or I will never eat, okay, meat for the rest of my life. You weaken your body. You will weaken your body. And then the self or the nafs after some time will get so tired and bored with re these restrictions because they are not divine restrictions, their personal restrictions. So they will get so tired with that, that it will abandon them and a whole lot of sharia ah as well, because it is too tired. So the balance of Islam is that you do not restrict yourself so much. Out of discipline, you can do sometimes. So sometimes you will say, today I will fast. Or today my dinner is going to be a simple dinner. Okay? Today... My dinner will be something that is very light. I'm not going to eat chicken and meat and rice and this. Something that is very light. This week, okay, I'm going to be humble in what I wear. This week, I'm going to be humble in what I eat. That's fine. Why? Out of discipline. To um, teach yourself that you can live without these things if you want to. That you have power over them. They don't have power over you. That you can say no to them whenever you need to say no to them. You're not a slave of fashion and brands and whatever you need to wear and whatever you need to eat. You're not a slave of your desire. You have control over it. So to discipline yourself, you can deny it sometimes. To deny it all the time goes against the sunnah. But now if you choose a particular path in life, let's say, and you want to live a humbler life and you want to wear humbler clothes, which is virtuous, by the way, without denying yourself halal, but humbler, you're being more humble. If you do this, don't think that you're better than everybody else just because of the path that you have chosen. So if I decide, for instance, as some had done in Islamic history, okay, um, they decided that they will wear wool, suf, nothing else. That in itself is not sunnah. That in itself yeah, becomes bid'ah. But anyway, if you decide that you will wear that or something humble, that I, I'm, you know, Consistently, I'm going to be humble in what I wear. But because of your clothes, you're going to start thinking that you're better than everybody else who's not wearing the same clothes as you. That becomes arrogant. That's a back door for kibra and arrogance. So you're not arrogant because of the expensive clothes that you're wearing. You're arrogant because of the humble clothes that you are wearing, thinking that you're better than everybody else. So you have to watch out for that as well. That is a problem. You have to watch out for that. So that's why that sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu is the best. What is the best fasting? If somebody asks you. So what is the best fasting? To fast one day and skip another. Why? Because you don't follow or adhere 
to one particular lifestyle. I'm fasting all the time or I'm eating all the time, but you alternate. And as you alternate, you experience both. You experience the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal when you eat and you experience self-discipline when you don't eat. Both. Okay. So that's kind of the gist of what he is trying to say. Don't restrict yourself, right? <clears throat> now, he moves on and he says, what you dislike, leave. What, without being... Let me see, did I miss, miss a part here? Um, I don't think I did. Okay, yeah, good. He says, what you dislike, leave without being harsh or critical of food and follow the pro way the prophet. As if you hate something, you hate particular food. He says, if you hate a particular food, simply don't eat it. Don't eat it, leave it, but don't criticize it. Don't criticize it. Don't be harsh. Harsh with the one who cooked it or harsh with your criticism of food. Oh, yuck, this is disgusting, whatever, right? So don't do that. Because the way of Rasulullah he never criticized food ever. If he liked it, he ate it. And if he did not, he, do, he wouldn't. And that is a great adab. That is a great adab. You know, A, because you may hurt the feelings of the person who cooked it and spent hours cooking it. Oh, this is terrible. This is this and this is that. So there is lack of gratitude. That's one. The second is what? This is still a ni'mah from Allah Azza wa Jal. You may not like it, but somebody else may. So when you criticize it, that person who likes it may start having second thoughts about it. Okay? May not appreciate it may look down on it, but it is still ni'mah. And they like it, but because you said something, now they started to rethink what they like and dislike. So, um, once you know, they cooked for the Prophet ﷺ what is called a dhab. A dhab is a lizard, a desert lizard. It's halal to eat. It's kind of, it's a big lizard. It's halal to eat. So they cooked it. Why we don't know halal to eat? Because of the hadith. So they cooked it for him and they brought it. He didn't touch it. So the Sahabi sitting next to him, he said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, is it haram? So he said, No, except that this is not the food of my people. So I don't find myself craving this or liking to eat it. So the Sahabi next to him, he ate it. So here, because the Prophet ﷺ was asked, he didn't volunteer and say, Hey, I don't like this. He was asked, is this haram? Meaning, why aren't you not eating it? Okay, Why aren't you not eating it? So he said, he explained then. He says, because this is not the food of my people. I did not grow up with it. So I look at it and I don't think that this is something that I would like to eat. I don't, I don't desire this. But you can if you wish. And that's why the, the um, Sahabi ate it and he didn't say anything to it. Meaning that it is halal. But the Prophet did not like it. Yeah, we know also, for instance, that the Prophet ﷺ did not eat garlic and onions. Okay? He did not eat garlic and onions, but they are what? They are halal. So not everything that the Prophet did not eat is haram. No, no. They're personal taste as well. But to keep in mind that he ﷺ did not criticize food. So if you there is food you don't like, you simply don't eat. You simply don't eat. Or you inform that this is not something that I usually eat or that I like. This this is why I'm doing that, right? So that's also an edit. He also says, Rahimahullah, he says, And do not drink from the mouth of the container and the broken side of a cup and examine it for safety and drink slowly and swallow. These things, we talked about them before. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, inshallah, with them. Again, he says, Do not drink from the mouth of the container and not a broken side of a cup. And examine it for safety, meaning before you drink, I look at that container so to make sure that it's safe, it's not contaminated, there are no animals in it and the likes. And drink slowly and swallow. Don't gulp, meaning just drink slowly so that it's better, it's better for your uh, system. And remove the cup from your mouth and drink thrice, meaning remove, you know, when you're drinking, remove the cup, breathe, come back, 
breathe, come back and drink, breathe, come back and drink. So breathe three times. And so drink from that cup in, in, three, uh, in three times, right? For it is more quenching and better for the thirsty. Okay, so we talked about these things before. So don't drink from the uh, mouth of the container unless it is your own. Unless it is your own container, it's not shared. And if it is transparent, so we understand that there's, you could see what's inside the water. There's nothing in it that might harm you. Then you can drink from that bottle directly, right? You can drink from, if it's a share, shared bottle, it's better that you don't drink from the mouth of the bottle itself, okay? A broken side of a cup, we explained why previously, right? It could injure you, injure you. There might be some contaminations there that could gather, so it's not safe, so you don't drink from the broken side of a cup. Uh, drink slowly, remove the cup from your, from your mouth, so when you're drinking, you don't breathe in the cup, okay? Okay? You don't breathe into the cup. Now, there is an incident here where the Prophet ﷺ uh, woke up at night, went, there was a, a container hanging, he went and he drank directly from the mouth of that container. So uh, there was a Sahabiya, a female Sahabiya, who saw that and she went and she cut that part, the mouth of the container, because it touched the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ and she kept that with her, right? Because they used to seek blessings from the uh, mouth of the Prophet, from the body of the Prophet or what had touched his body. So she cut it because of that. So there is evidence there that when there is a need, you can drink from the mouth of a container, the mouth of the bottle, when there is a need. But the general practice should be no, if it is something that is shared. Okay? Practice should be no, if it is something that is shared. Other than that, um, yani, it's, um, yeah, so the practice, no. If there's a need, then it is, it is allowed because the Prophet at least did it once, right? But it's not the habit. It's not the habit, right? Okay. And then he also says, and do not dislike drinking while standing. Okay, so we have to explain this. And do not dislike drinking while standing, and do not dislike wearing your shoes while standing in the most correct of opinions. So, what, why does he say, and do not dislike drinking while standing? Why does he say that? Do not dislike drinking while standing. Because here you have a hadith. On the one side, they tell you, do not drink while you're standing. So one hadith that says, and it's in the Sahih, نَهَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَوْ زَجَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ عَنِ الشُّرْبِ قَائِمًا He prohibited sta uh, drinking while standing. He prohibited drinking while standing. Anas the Sahabi was asked, how about eating, meaning eating while standing? He said that's worse. Okay? So he said that is worse. So you have these hadith, and we've mentioned some other, some other hadith that prohibit um, uh, drinking while you stand. One of them, you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that, we did not mention that before. The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, if the person who drinks while standing knows what they're putting in their stomach, they would vomit. They would vomit that out. And that's how serious that hadith is, that if you were to know what you're putting or what you're doing at, when you are drinking while standing, you would vomit that out. So we understand that there is harm in it, there's prohibition in it, there is something disliked about it to be avoided. So we have these hadith. But we have also other hadith that say, كان رسول الله يشرب قائما وقاعدا the Prophet ﷺ used to drink while standing and sitting. There's that hadith. There's another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ once went to drink from Zamzam, meaning in the Kaaba in Mecca, right? And he was standing and he drank from Zamzam while he was standing. There's that hadith. There is Ibn Umar. Uh, عنه, he, once was, uh, he was once said, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, we used to eat while walking 
and drink while standing. That we used to do that at this time, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the scholars, when they look at both of these things, what do they say? They say, okay, the Prophet sallallahu the fact that the Prophet sallallahu drank at one time or multiple times while standing tells you that it is allowed when there is a need. Otherwise, the habit, the default should be that you drink while sitting down so that you can reconcile all of these hadith. Because when you look at them, you'll think that they contradict each other. They said, no, he did it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, libayan al-jawaz, that it is to show that it is permissible when there is a need. So for instance, if something is hanging, like in that other hadith we mentioned, a container is hanging, and he wants to drink from it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Maybe uh, he cannot bring it down. So he drinks from it while he is standing, or he's going to and drinking from Zamzam. It's not possible to sit down. Okay, there's no place, it's crowded. So he drinks while he's standing, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Or, you know, uh, um, as, as Ibn Umar, you know, explained, right? Uh, they may need to, need, need to leave one place and go to the other, and they have some food in their hand, um, and they have not have the time to sit and eat. Then they will sit while they uh, eat while they're walking. So when there is a need, it can be done. But the default position should be that when you want to eat and drink, you sit. If there is no place and there is no time, then you are allowed to eat and drink while you are standing. Okay, so that's that default. But because the other hadith that stress. Don't drink while you're standing because they are also serious. We say put an emphasis on that. Put an emphasis that if you're home at work, you can sit and drink, then sit and drink. And don't sit while you're standing. So try, inshallah, to practice this sunnah. Try to practice this adab. Um, same thing, inshallah, with eating while standing or walking. The same thing, right? If there's an opportunity for you to sit, you sit. If there is no opportunity, there is no time, then you can do it while standing. Uh, the part of the verse here is that it says that there is, there is a, hadith, a hadith that says, uh, Rasulullah The Prophet وسلم, prohibited that a person would put on his or her shoes while standing. But this will deal with, inshallah, later on. Not now, because we're still talking about food. Later on, this thing, inshallah, will come. Let's discuss, inshallah, some few manners related to food, inshallah, before we conclude that part. So, one, inshallah, it's not mentioned uh, in the text itself, but it's, it's an addition, inshallah. So, when presenting food, if you're presenting food to somebody, you have drinks on a tray, or you're presenting something you want people to taste, and you have a gathering, and you go in, and you want to start. Where do you start? Right? Where do you start? We take from... The actions of the Sahaba for the Prophet ﷺ is that when they brought something, they gave it to him first. So milk, let's say they had milk and they wanted to serve milk. Uh, okay, you have to milk, you know, you had milk and you want to bring it into its group. Where do you begin? You begin with the right or you begin with somebody maybe in the middle. And if you're going to pick someone, who are you going to pick? At the time of Rasulullah ﷺ, they would take the thing directly to him. And give it to him. Even though he's sitting in the middle, he's not at the right. Directly to him. And then from there, he وسلم, will move it to the right. So at one time, the Prophet وسلم, had Abu Bakr sitting to his left. And an Arabi, a Bedouin, nameless, you know, we don't even know his name in the hadith, sitting to his right. So they brought that thing to him. Milk or some, or some food. They brought it to him. Now, when he was about to finish, Umar noticed, Abu Bakr is here, the Arabi is there. So he said, O Prophet of Allah, Abu Bakr is here, give it to Abu Bakr. He's on the left. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, Al-Aymanoon, Al-Aymanoon. He said, the right ones, the ones on the right. So he gave it to the Arabi, even though Abu Bakr is better. So how you start, okay, how you start is you pick the most virtuous or the most knowledgeable or the oldest in the gathering. So you're serving food, where do you begin? Okay, where do you begin? The oldest or the most virtuous? Yeah, if known, yani. he's an imam, he's a sheikh, whatever, or the most knowledgeable. And then from that, they move to the right. From that, they move to the right of that person. This is how it goes. If you go into a gathering and everybody is equal, okay, you, you begin with your right and you move. 
okay? So that no one is angry. If you, you don't know who is older, you don't know how old each person is and it's not clear. Um, everybody's equal in knowledge and, you know, practice and taqwa and whatever, right? You can't choose. So begin with the right and then move to your left. So this is how you present. That's adab, yani, inshallah. Um, there's a dua also, um, when you finish, when you finish your food, you can say Alhamdulillah. Also, what is recorded from the Prophet Sallallahu is, when he ate food once, he said, Allahumma barik lan, Allahumma, Allahumma barik lana fihi wa atina khayran minhu. Ya Allah, bless it for us and give us something better than it. And when he drank milk, he said, Ya Allahumma barik lana fihi wa zidna minhu. Ya Allah, bless it for us and give us more of it. He said Sallallahu Alaihi then, because I do not know of something that can satisfy or will function as both a drink, as food, as milk does. يُغْنِي مِنَ الطَّعَامِ وَالشَّرَابِ كَلَّبًا So he said that milk does both functions. It is drink and it is food. Drink and food. So, um, okay. So YouTube stopped actually. خير إن شاء الله. Um, so, that's a dua that you say, you would say when you're drinking milk. Allahumma barik lana fihi wa zidna minhu. Ya Allah, bless it for us and give us more. Bless it for us and give us more. Whereas you would say what with other, other food, all other food, Allahumma barik lana fihi wa atina khayran minhu. Ya Allah, bless it for us and give us better than it. Okay? Now, um, this is something interesting. He says, it is not recommended to kiss inanimate al jamadat, inanimate objects, except one, which is what al hajar al aswad, the black stone. This is the black stone. It's recommended istilam al hajar al aswad, right? You would go if you have a chance, right? You would go, you would touch it, you would kiss it, and you would continue your with your tawaf. He says that's the only thing that is recommended for you to kiss. Other than that. It's not recommended that you kiss food. We talked about kissing the mushaf, if you remember, right? It's not recommended also that you kiss food. Sometimes people say, okay, you have to kiss bread. Okay, kiss bread and, you know, put it on their forehead or, or something falls on the ground, you just kiss it. That's not recommended. This is just basically culture or habit. But it's not really recommended and it's not in the sunnah. Something also good, inshallah, to keep in mind. Because sometimes we inherit these things and you think, oh, what, is it sunnah? No, not really. It is not. It's not sunnah. Uh, also, it's recommended that uh, you make dua. If, if someone hosts you, you make dua for them. You make dua for them. So, um, one of the dua of the Prophet ﷺ was, أَفْطَرَ عِنْدَكُمُ الصَّائِمُونَ وَأَكَلَ طَعَامَكُمُ الْأَبْرَارُ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَفْطَرَ عِنْدَكُمُ الصَّائِمُونَ May fasting people break their fast, uh, eating your food. وَأَكَلَ طَعَامَكُمُ الْأَبْرَارِ May the righteous eat your food. وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ May the, ma the angels make salah for you, meaning dua for you. So that's a beautiful dua that you can say to someone when they host you. You finished eating and you give them that dua. And it's a beautiful dua. So what you're asking for is that the fasting people would break their fast on their food. Why? Because you earn rewards equal to their fast. So it's a great uh, a great invitation. If fasting people accept your invitation and they come to eat at your house. A great invitation. Okay? And the second thing is that may the righteous eat your food. Then, then the righteous keep your company and the righteous remind you and the righteous are your friends. So that's also a beautiful dua. And the last one, may the angels make uh, salah for you. Right? It's not only my dua, but even the angels, may they make dua for you. Khair, inshallah. Um, okay, so because of the technical difficulties we've been facing today, inshallah, I think I'll just stop here and I'll answer a few questions, inshallah. And I'll try, inshallah, uh, to keep it under an hour. Um, a reminder, inshallah, again, if you're just joining us. So next week, inshallah, because of the time change, we will start our lecture, Toronto time, at 7 o'clock, inshallah. It's not 8, so we'll do it at 7. So again, if you're in Malaysia, that's not going to affect you because you will still be at 8 
even though it's our seven, but it will be your eight. But if you're here in Toronto or anybody else, and please adjust and make sure that you join us, inshallah, at 7 o'clock p.m. Saturday night, inshallah. So make a mark, inshallah, just so that you don't miss it, inshallah. Just uh, note it in your calendar or have a reminder, inshallah. Tayyip. Um, I knew that there were some questions here on Facebook. Let me see if I can catch them. Um, is it sunnah to drink zamzam while standing? No, we don't, we're not going to say that it is sunnah to drink zamzam while standing. Uh, it is sunnah to drink zamzam. And standing, if, there is, if you can't sit, then stand. If the scene in, in the Kaaba, around the Kaaba, is that you can't sit while you're drinking zamzam, there are stations, of course, right? There are different stations where you could get zamzam. Some stations are not crowded at all. So, I mean, you get the water and you sit and you drink. That would be the sunnah. But if you are very close to the Kaaba, let's say, or it's really crowded and you can't sit and people are making tawaf, there's no space for you to sit. So drink while standing, right? So the sunnah is to drink while sitting down. But, you know, out of necessity, out of need, of course, you can do it while, while uh, standing, inshallah. There was another question here. Um... If we have, let me try to read it. If we have extended family member who likes to comment about quality of food and almost everything, what would be wise ways to advise? We have advised a few times, but it seems not effective. Also, some extended family members drinking using the left hand. Appreciate your advice. Okay, effectively. So um, here are two things. There are people who are critical of food and people who um, drink with their left hand. And there's nothing else that you can do except reminders. Like, what do you do with a person who's drinking with their left hand? Well, you tell them that the shaitan drinks with you. Hopefully, Yanni, they're receptive. They're receptive to that type of advice. If they're not receptive, don't give that advice because they may ridicule it or they may not take it seriously. So you either find someone who can give them that advice or wait for the right time. Or make dua for them. But you tell them, the shaitan drinks with their left hand. Means that whatever you're doing, whatever you're drinking, is not being blessed. You're not receiving the benefit from it. Would you want that for yourself? That should scare us and scares anybody, right? Who drinks and thinking that the shaitan is drinking with them. So hopefully, inshallah, you know, and you know, there's another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ um, again, a, a person was sitting next to him. And he's eating with his left hand. And uh, that person said, uh, the Prophet told him, Kul biyaminik, eat with your right. He said, I can't. He told him, eat with your right. He says, I can't. I think he may have repeated it three times. Eat with your right. He said, I can't. He said, lastata'ta. He says, may you not. So he couldn't use his right hand anymore. And they said that it's not that he was left-handed. He was just doing it out of stubbornness. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ, he would have known, what? That this person simply, truly cannot. He would not kept kept telling him, do it, do it, do it. If he knew that he could not, he was not simply left-handed. The person simply did not want to. So just also think about it, that such um, challenge to the command of the Prophet ﷺ is serious. So you tell them that, maybe inshallah that will convince them. And it's just so easy to switch hands. Uh, criticism of food, that could be habit. And I don't know how old they are. And I don't know if they will listen. Uh, but tell them. Tell them our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is how he behaved with food. He never criticized any food. If he didn't like it, he did not eat it. Now if you have recommendations on how to fix it, sure, fine, you can recommend it. But criticism of food and the cook and what they cooked, right? That's not helpful, right? But if you have advice, you can, you can give advice. It's different from criticism. Tayyip, there, there were three questions uh, that had come to us from last week. Um, and inshallah, let me try to remember them so I would um, answer them. And I really hope that the sister who had asked them, I assume it's a sister, uh, as I remember, I, I ask Allah that she is there so that she can, inshallah, hear the answers. Anyway, inshallah, the first one was that if you inj inj injure your hand and um, can you wear glo a glove over your hand so that you can make uh, wudu 
okay, with a glove. So of course, now, if you injure your hand, there's a wound there. Uh, if the wound is small enough and you can put a Band-Aid on it, a plaster on it, uh, then you can wash your hand, you can wash over it. And that's fine, inshallah, right? Even though that water is not gonna reach certain parts of your skin, where the, ba the Band-Aid has covered, but that's fine. If the wound is big and there's a big uh, bandage over it, and it, uh, if uh, water touches it, it either will harm it or it will delay recovery, you are allowed to just simply wipe over it, not wash it, just simply wipe over it and wash the rest of your uh, arm. So for instance, let's suppose it is here, okay? So that part, you wouldn't wash. You would just wipe over this part and you would wash here from the wrist to the elbow and including the elbow. So you would wash this part, but you would exclude this part so that it remains dry. So whether you really, I mean, there is no need for you to wear a glove because you can simply wipe over it. Okay, you can just simply wipe over it. Okay, so let me know if this answers this first question. Maybe there is something I did not understand in it or did not imagine accurately. But I don't imagine that you need to wear a glove, right, uh, over it. If, uh, if the injury really is more serious, yeah, I mean, God forbid there is a burn, you know, and it covered most of the hand, and yeah, then, you know, you can wear a glove so that no water at all would touch it, and then, then that you would be fine, inshallah, if that's the case. So I don't know the nature of the injury, but I hope that that have answered it. Second, if you are praying the fard, the second question, if you are praying the farida, and... What happens is that you remember that you forgot to pray the sunnah. Okay, the pre farida sunnah. Can you change your intention and shift from fard to sunnah while you are praying? While you are praying. You see, that is a possibility. You can do this. So example, I started to pray uh, al duhr the farida, the obligation. I'm, I'm in the first rak'ah, let's say. I'm in the first rak'ah, and remember, I did not pray the sunnah, I forgot. I was distracted, I forgot. You can switch your intention from farida to sunnah. That's an option, you can do this. The other option, because you forgot, you can make up that sunnah later. So you have another option. So you can switch your intention, if you're praying the farida, from farida to sunnah. You cannot do the opposite. If you're praying sunnah, switch it from sunnah to farida. So you can go from the top, uh, the higher to the lower. The higher being farida, lower being the sunnah. You can go from the higher to the lower. Not from the lower to the higher in shifting intentions while you are praying. So two options. I'm praying duhur, first rak'ah. I remember, I did not pray the sunnah. Forgot about it. Two options. A, switch my intention. Now I'm praying sunnah instead of farida, the obligation. That's fine. The other option is, no, I'll pray the farida, the obligation of dhuhr. Once I'm done, I'll make up the sunnah. I'll pray the sunnah that I was supposed to pray before, and I'll pray the sunnah that I am going to pray after. So you have both of these options. The third, inshallah, question uh, from uh, the sister is... Uh, can we give, uh, the uh, question was exactly, can we give Islamic names to our pets? So if we have pets, can we give Islamic names? Um, I would say, can we give human names to our pets? Okay, so for instance, you know, uh, I have a cousin whose name is Khalid and I have a cat that I'm calling it Khalid as well. Can I give cats, um, human names, Arabic names, okay? Arabic human names. We'll say, okay, first, there is no specific evidence to prohibit this. There is no specific evidence to say, don't give animals names specific to human beings. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, the practice at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was what? Was that they gave animals names. So the Prophet, had animals. So he had a, a donkey called Ufayr. He gave it a name, Ufayr. And he had a mule called Duldul. And he had a camel 
القصواء and another العضباء had names and they were known by these names but these names were not human names these were names that were describing the body or the color or the shape or the function that's what it is it's describing the animal right so we say this was the habit and the practice at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and I would say this is the best habit. So we wouldn't give animals human uh, Arabic Islamic names because these are specific to humans. We would give them names that are pet names that as I said are related to maybe their function, their breed, their color, their speed, uh, something distinctive about them. Uh, funny names, interesting names, that's what it is, right? So that's, those are the names that will be reserved for pets and humans will have their own names, right? So this is the habit and that's what I would recommend, Wallahu um, I don't, I don't think I saw any more questions on Facebook, no. Uh, okay, inshallah, let me see. Okay, there are some here. If by mistake I start fart prayer before doing the sunnah prayer, should I change the niyyah or perform sunnah? So that's, I've answered this inshallah, I think, right? Uh, okay. The supplication for someone who is hosting a meal for you. أفطر عندكم الصائمون وأكل طعامكم الأبرار وصلت عليكم الملائكة Inshallah, you don't need to memorize it from me right now. I think you'll find it in the book of Adhkar. أفطر عندكم الصائمون May the fasting people eat, uh, break their fast on your food. وأكل طعامكم الأبرار May the righteous eat your meals, eat your food. And may the angels say salah for you. So if you say these things, this is, you know, a beautiful dua. You can say also أطعم الله من أطعمنا وسق الله من سقانا May Allah feed the one who fed us and may Allah give drink to the one who gave us drink. So again, you're asking Allah to reward them for what they have done to you. And that's also beautiful, subhanAllah, because you know that I can reward you and I can invite you and all of this, but the best, and we should, right? If somebody invites you, invite them. It's etiquette, and you know, it's polite. But what I'm saying is that the best reward is not simply that my invitation, the best reward is Allah rewarding you for, for what you have done. So um, it's a good thing, inshallah, to remember. Available in the fortress of the Muslim. Barakallahu feekum. Okay, khair, inshallah. So I don't see any more questions and I haven't seen any on Instagram. Okay. No. Tayyib, inshallah. Khair, inshallah. So um, we'll say, inshallah, um, we're not going to start the, uh, the part about uh, the attire, etiquette related to attire, inshallah, because we lost YouTube completely. So inshallah, I don't know, we'll see. Hopefully, inshallah, we don't have this uh, next time. Uh, but at least we had Facebook and Instagram, at least, inshallah. So um, etiquettes of attire and clothes, that will be inshallah next week, we in the Azzawajal. So I apologize for any disruption. Um, remember, inshallah. So if you're in Toronto, next week we'll be meeting at 7, not 8. If you're in Malaysia, it's still 8 for you. If you're anywhere else, Insha'Allah, try to adjust and see what is 7 p.m. Toronto time in your time, insha'Allah. Tayyib, barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullahu khaira. We got a little distracted today because of the disruptions. But khair, insha'Allah. Uh, whatever Allah wills is best, insha'Allah. We'll try to um, improve next time, insha'Allah. Uh, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to teach us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us patience and to guide us to what He loves, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the best of deeds, to the best of actions, and to the best of intentions to give us the best of company in this life and in the hereafter. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us uh, the worst of the, the, our evil deeds, the worst of our deeds, uh, to forgive us shirk, whether we know about it or not, bid'ah, whether we know about it or not, the hidden mistakes that we have to make us aware of them so that we can fix them and seek repentance before our death. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala before our death that he would lead us to a good deed and that he takes our souls while, we, while he is pleased with us.
so that we are among the righteous in this life when we die and when we are resurrected we ask Allah to forgive us forgive our parents forgive our wives and husbands we'll forgive our children our loved ones our teachers our families close and extended we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from every harm we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the best in this life and in the hereafter jazakumullahu khairan inshallah we'll see you next week bi'idhnillah subhanakallahu wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh